It's my pleasure to welcome Marie Amélie Long uh, from Imperial College in London, speaking on journalized spin structures and homogeneous spaces. Thanks. Th thank you very much for the for the kind invitation. Uh, I think it's a really nice idea this seminar, and uh, I mean, I, I would I would actually love to be on the list and continue coming afterwards because I, I think it's really nice. Um, so um, my talk today is going to be uh, well, about journalized spin structures. So basically the idea, if you have a lot of um, theories like Zagberg witten or K-theory or, you know, uh, need uh, spin manifolds. But uh, what do you do in the case where you don't have a spin manifold? So in particular, I'm also interested in homogeneous spaces, um, where partly simply because these spaces are simpler. <laughs> um, so I I'm going to link the two and, and talk especially about G invariant or G equivariant structures on uh, on homogeneous spaces, spin structures on homogeneous spaces. So uh, the story I'm I'm going to to tell you is based on three papers. So the first one is um, about spin structures, so not generalized spin structures, um, and uh, and the G equivariants of these spin structures on a different homogeneous decomposition of spheres. So this is a joint work with uh, two of my students. Um, and then there is a generalization of the former paper to the generalized spin structures, the so-called spin R structures. And to motivate a little bit why we're doing that um, is, uh, is the last paper, which, uh, which is common work with uh, Ilka Agricola and my PhD student, uh, Jordan Hoffman. And it's more about um, why invariant spinners and geometric structures on, uh, on manifolds. So I don't know how familiar um, you guys are with spin structures. So I, I'm just decided to be uh, slow at the beginning and to recall what a spin structure is. So in order to have a spin structure, we need um, we need a Riemannian manifold, uh, and we need to be orientable because what we're going to do is that we are going to consider the frame bundle. So uh, on every Riemannian manifold, we have a, a frame bundle. We take the bundle of of frames at every point. And um, the structure group of this bundle is SON because it's orientable and, uh, and the metric is positive definite. So uh, we have a, an SON principal bundle. And then we can consider the, well, I guess, well-known 2 to 1 covering of SON, which is given by the, by the spin group. Um, and what we want with this to construct a spin structure or a spin bundle on our manifold. So in other words, a spin structure is a pair um, given by, a, well, a spin bundle with, with structure group spin um, and a two to one covering of the frame bundle by the spin bundle. And of course we want, um, we want uh, the, the operation of the group to be compatible. So we want this diagram here to commute. So lambda again is, uh, is a two to one covering of the bundle and lambda n here um, is, is a two to one covering of SO. So we want everything to commute nicely and be compatible. So we know that uh, the existence of spin structure is a topological abstraction. So they mean that the, the second Stiefel Whitney class um, has to be zero. And, um, and this is really like, if you, if you look at it in terms of classifying spaces and uh, how, you, how you show that these, these topological abstraction work when it's really a generalization of orientation these spin structures right because um uh if you look at the topological uh, abstraction in the case of um in the case of orientation what well, the really relevant abstraction the homotopy fiber of the relevant abstraction is just um the classifying space you try to lift o n to s o n right so and this is in terms of pi one this is the orientation and um, for the for the spin structure, this is in terms of pi two, right? It's the same. It's a lift of S O N now to spin N, and this is in terms of pi two. Um, so some examples of spin manifolds are well surfaces, orientable surfaces. One has to say because again, a manifold has to be orientable to be spin. Orientable three manifold always always spins, and then <coughs> you have examples of some um, special geometry. So G two manifold in dimension seven. Are, are spin. Three size I can manifold has spin, quaternion killer manifold in, in particular dimension has spin. And um this is really this can be expressed as we discovered in terms of holonomy. So bear with me and we are going to see this manifold again 
um, and see a very easy criterion actually to show via uh, holonomy that they have been. Um, the spheres are an example of manifold, and I guess this is really uh, why we started to look at these homogeneous spheres as the, as the different decomposition of the of the homogeneous uh, spheres. Spheres have a unique spin structures, right? Uh, except of the case of S one, because this is not simply connected. Um, well, we have two different spin structures. So in general, actually, for um, for homogeneous space, so if so, in general. And these are this is just for later. If if we have a homogeneous space simply connected and pi one of H is equal to pi one of G, then M is spin. And unique as well. All right. Um well this looks all very nice, but actually for some very simple manifold like the complex, well, simple, right? but, but for relatively simple manifolds, like the complex um, projective space in, in even dimension offers a real projective space for certain um, dimensions, the, um, they, they have no, no spin structure. So they are not spin, these manifolds. So before I start doing all this work with spinners and spin geometry, I want to give a little bit of motivation um, why we why we use these spinners and spin geometry? So for those of you maybe who are not that used to uh, spin geometry, <clears throat> so my uh, my motive, my personal motivation, is that um, I will look at special spinners. So for example, parallel spinners or killing spinners, and um, it is well known that special spinners uh, can be linked to a special holonomy, and that they encode information about the geometry of the manifold. So the, the first paper maybe about that is the paper of Wang, uh, which follow Berger classification of holonomic group. And what Wang did is that he looked at, uh, he classified manifolds admitting parallel spinners in terms of holonomy, um, uh, in terms of the Berger list of holonomic group. And um, these manifolds, this is a very uh, strong restriction because these manifolds are richly flat. And uh, so, so it gives you a very strong information about the geometry of the manifold. And this means in particular, so for the, the only symmetric spaces with parallel spinners of the flat one. So then in the 80s, 90s came the result by Friedrich uh, and Baer, uh, classifying the manifolds admitting like a generalization of parallel spinners. Um, I mean, they, they gave a, a classification of killing spinners. And this is especially nice, this classification, because it gives new results and new examples of manifolds with particular geometry. So uh, these manifolds especially are Einstein. And uh, so they, they could give new example of Calabria manifold and spin seven and G2 manifolds. Um, and then later on, uh, started all this business with non-integrable geometry because th those special spinners are for the levi civita connection. But one can also, this is as, as I said before, very restrictive. But we can also um, look at connections which are non-integrable and, uh, and look at special spinners for these uh, connections with torsions. And here too, they are very much linked to, um, to G structures and uh, especially co-calibrated G2 manifold, which, which, one can, which are in one-to-one -one bijection with, um, with, with special, some kind of special spinners. So this is my personal motivation. But of course, um, I mean, everyone has, has heard about the Witten theory when it's existence on some spin structure on, on four-dimensional manifold. Well, the problem with the witten theory is that not all four-dimensional manifolds have spin, right? Two and three-dimensional manifolds have spin, but not all four-dimensional manifolds have spin. Um, and this is why instead of considering spin manifolds for this theory, they consider a generalization um, of spin structure, which are the so-called spin C structures. So the idea of these uh, of these spin C structures is to enlarge the spin group. So um, instead of considering the group spin, one considering one considers the product of spin n with a circle with a u one, um, quotiented by the diagonal. 
right? So then and this is the this is the structure. And one does the the old construction I've done, you know, with the two to one covering of the spin bundle. But this time, instead of having a spin structure, a spin bundle, um, I have a spin C bundle. Um, and for I mean, like past dimension four, if you want to generalize that big written equation to uh, to some higher dimension, well then spin C doesn't work anymore because for example, all not all five dimensional manifold are spin C. So you pass this, the so-called spin H, where well, instead of tensoring with um, the unit complex um, of taking the product with the unit complex numbers, you take the product with um, the unit quaternions. Okay, and you do the same business again. So um, what one can notice is that U1 uh, is actually spin two and uh, SP1 is actually spin three. So I can give a definition of generalized spin structure for um, for spin R, for the group spin R, where we take the product with the group spin R, and then we take this quotient again with the center by the by um, by the group Z two, right? So uh, these I have said already. So there is a natural inclusion of um, spin R into spin S for R smaller than S, uh, meaning later that we have if we have for example um, a spin uh, a spin structure, then we necessarily have a spin C structure, right? We have a a, a spin R structure with R higher. So how we do the, how do we do the, the generalized construction of um, of the spin R structure? Well, we notice that there are canonical group homomorphisms going from spin R to S O N and uh, spawn spin R N to S O R, right? So those are not covering, but they are nicely defined um, homomorphism. And with these two homomorphism, we can define a two to one covering of um, of SON cross of the group SON cross SOR, right? Just by taking the well, taking the pair of the two previous uh, homomorphism. So now we have a nice two to one covering. Um, so we can just define our spin R structures similar to spin structures. And those those structures were are relatively new actually. They were defined by Spinoza and Herrera in 2016. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I have a terrible cold, so I hope you can still hear me. Um, so it's been our structure. It's just a pair of uh, a spin R bundle and a two to one covering, again, of the frame, SON frame bundle, such that everything as before is compatible with um, with with operation of the group, right? With operation of spin R on the on the fibers and with the with the operation of the with the action of SON on the fiber of SON. So in other words, uh, here we have like our two to one covering of SON cross um, SOR. Here we have uh, our um, our first component, right? Because we are projecting onto SON, um, and it has to commute this diagram. So now this defines the spin R structure, but another interesting bundle which is a famous auxiliary auxiliary line bundle in the case of spin C geometry. It's just instead of projecting here um, along lambda n, we project along the other of these two um, homomorphism. And then we get an associated principal SOR bundle, uh, which is a higher dimensional equivalent of, of the auxiliary, auxiliary line bundle in the spin C case. So as I said before, for R smaller than S, um, a spin R manifold is necessarily spin S because we have this nice inclusion of the of the spin groups. So the existence of spin R structures uh, is also known to be a topological abstraction for R smaller equal to three. So this was shown by Albanese and Milovojevic in uh, in 21. So all these interests into the spin R structure is relatively recent. Um, but it's a different kind of topological obstruction um, because in the case of maybe I can that for spin, for the spin structures, we had that the second shift for the class was zero. For spin C, 
is something in terms of the integral of the, let's call it big V3, of the third Stiefel Whitney class. Um, for spin H, it's already not that nice anymore. It's some abstractions. on W5, on the integral class of W5. But when it gets higher, um, you cannot really have any more a nice abstraction in terms of um, of second Schiffel Whitney classes. So what we have Mili uh, Vojevic, I think. I have a problem with this name. I can't remember it. Um, so we have that M is spin R. If and only if there exists an orientable rank R real vector bundle E over M such that um, TM plus E is spin, right? So in other words, we, we have V2 TM is equal to V2E, right, by what we've said before. Um, or in other words, M immerses, or embeds its, its equivalent in this case, in a spin manifold. With co-dimension R. So what this says is that we are always going to have, um, but this is not, really interesting one might one might say we, we always have a spin n structure with n the dimension of the manifold so by Whitney's embedding theorem we have that uh n m n is always embedded in uh in r two n right which is r two n is always spin so we can just take E is equal to TM and then we get uh, we get what we want, right? Because the first chief with Nick class of the sum is equal to the second is equal to zero. So we'll always, always have a spin N structure. So of course we we want to have something which is a which is of lower order, right? <laughs> so now if we have um if we have an oriented manifold, um we call sigma m the smallest r. So that that's m in is spin r, right? Because this is I mean this is a stronger topological abstraction. Well, so for example, as we said before, the diamond for dimension two, three, so all is oriented, right? Don't repeat oriented. So for dimension two, three, for G2 manifold, Calavillao manifold, odd quaternion Nikela manifold, and their spin, so sigma of M is one. Um, the sphere uh, has a spin type one. Uh, for the complex projective space of even, even dimension, we've seen it's not spin, but it's spin C. Um, for dimensions smaller or equal to four, we always have that they are spin C, but um, in dimension higher, we already don't necessarily have spin C anymore. Uh, in fact, I think um, I think it's Abaniz or Herrera proved that in dimension five, um, and uh, and dimension at least smaller than seven, if M is compact, then uh, the spin type is three. So the manifold is automatically spin H. For um for those dimension, but on the other hand, for every R bigger or equal to one, there exists a close, smooth, simply connected manifold, um, which which doesn't have spin R structure. So, for example, uh, the Wu manifold, right? So, oof, example. The Wu manifold as uh, what was it? SU three over SO three is spin H, but the product is not right. So R 
uh, is bigger than three here. So, I mean, it is not, um, it's not like all manifold has been H, like it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable um, definition here. Um, and well, I mean, as we said before, because the manifold is always spin N, right? The spin type is when, well defined. So the um, the spin type is always going to be between one. It's a spin structure or maximal. It's a, it's a spin N structure for every oriented manifold. So now because I am interested, like, I mean, these three papers have cited uh, with my students are on homogeneous spaces. Um, why am I interested in spin structures on homogeneous spaces? Well, because homogeneous spaces are simpler, <laughs> first of all. <coughs> and studying something on homogeneous space might, might give us an insight of uh, what we do in general. But, uh, but because of other reasons also, like many examples of non-integrable geometries, you know, like if you take um, curvature, uh, connection with torsions uh, are actually given by in general non-symmetric homogeneous spaces. So it's really interesting to see if you have a spin structure on these spaces, what are the particular spinners and how it behaves. Um, and also this is, uh, this is something which is really nice. There is a beautiful characterization of spin R structures on homogeneous space in terms of the lift of the isotropy, provided the spin structure is equivariant. And this is why I'm interested in these, uh, I am interested in these spin uh, R structures because once you know they are, um, they are, they are equi equivalents for the, for the group defining the homogeneous space, well, then you can just compute the isotropy um, representation, lift it, and then you, t you get invariant special spinners in terms of the lift of the isotropy. So it's particularly nice. Um, and finally, which was one of the reasons why we started um, uh, the, last, the last motivation, the, the papers on spheres, is that for the particular case of sphere, you can link um, equ equivariant spin structures to uh, to the holonomy representation, and we will see how we do that. So, quick um, quick reminder of homogeneous spaces. So, again, I didn't know. Uh, I don't know your group, unfortunately, so I, I don't know what exactly um, you're familiar with. So, uh, quick remember, I'm, I'm going to go fast over that. So, on uh, fixed notation. So I consider Riemannian manifold, a connected Lie group, uh, and a transitive action of G on the manifold. Uh, well, then um, the Cauchy space is called a homogeneous space, where H is the isotropy subgroup, so the stabilizer of the point for some fixed point. And so uh, there are two representations I'm interested in, uh, mostly the isotropy representation, but also the adjoint representation. So what is the isotropy the adjoint representation for me? We start with a group G. We consider the action by conjugation on, on the group. So this is something which is really particular of to the group. Um, and the, this gives a map if we drop the second variable from G to G given by the conjugation. Um, then we can take the differential. So we get a map at the level of Lie algebra given by the differential of the conjugation map. And then from there, we get the adjoint representation, which is a, just um, a representation of the, gr the group as usual on its the algebra. So um, yeah, very basic thing here. Um, on the other hand, we have the isotropy representation. So we start with a space, um, topological space for us, it's going to be a manifold, smooth manifold. We consider any action uh, of the group G on M and this similarly gives us a map if we drop the first variable from M to M. We can take again the differential, we get a group, um, a map at the level of um, of the tangent space. And for the isotropy, this gives us the isotropy representation uh, if we take the, the, um, the map in the point O or in the identity from the subgroup H, the isotropy subgroup H to, um, as a representation of the tension sp space in this point. So now we are particularly interested in Riemannian homogeneous spaces with the Riemannian metric, and those are reductive. So this means that um, if we take the, the Lie algebra as an H representation, um, this decomposes in the Lie algebra of H, and 
an orthogonal complement, which is at G invariant. Well, I mean, like at H, like the restriction of the adjoint on H invariant. So in particular, this is really nice because um, G acts by isometries, right? We, we, are, we are looking at the at Riemannian metric here by definition. Um, we have that uh, the tangent space of our homogeneous spaces in, uh, say, the identity is given by the quotient space of the Lie algebra, and it, it's uh, diffeomorphic to <laughs> to the to the complement M. And then we have this nice decomposition here of the adjoint representation in terms of the isotropy, right? So it means that um, it means that that add restricted to H on H is exactly the isotropy representation. So this gives us a nice, oops, sorry. This gives us a nice isomorphism um, in terms of the isotropy, right, um, of, the, of the frame bundle. So the frame bundle is actually isomorphic to um, the associated bundle via the, the isotropy representation. So this is a bundle isomorphism. And this is nice, right? You, we can all already see that if we want to construct um, a spin bundle over the thing, then this very likely means that you're going to have to lift the isotropy representation, right? If you want to have a very a compatible action with the with an action compatible with with um, the action of G. So, and this is exactly what I'm going to do next. So, what we want is a relation between speak structures and group action. So, um, we want to generalize the case of orientation. So, if we have an orientation preserving isometry on M. Um, how does that transform spin structures? So I just recall that if we have an isometry, right, this induce an isomorphism um, on the frame bundle, but we send the component, uh, well, basically to the, to the differential times of the component, right? So what we want to do, we want to extend this to a spin structure. So we want to find a map f tilde, which preserves the fibers and which is equivalent with respect to the action of, of spin R, right? So, um, so we know that if we have that, for every element of the group G, we have an isometry FG between, between the two spaces, but not the other way around, right? So our, our, um, our, what we want here is stronger. So this motivates uh, the, the following definition, right? A spin R structure uh, on a spin R homogeneous space is called G invariant. Well, exactly if it satisfied um, if the, the, the previous diagram commutes. So in other words, if the action of G on the principal bundle, a uh, spin R covers the action of G on the frame bundle, right? Um, and so in particular, for again, so this follows, but this is not an if and only if, right? So if for all G, uh, now we have an isomorphism of the spin bundle, the spin R bundle, such that this map commutes. Um, so now we define the G invariant spin type of a homogeneous manifold to be because, I mean, we might have a homogeneous, manif a homogeneous space which admits a spin structure, but this spin structure is not necessarily G invariant, right? We're going to see some criterion for these to be satisfied. So we just say that the G invariant spin type is the least number such that the spin R structure of the manifold is G invariant. So this is a, li a little bit uh, of a complicated construction now because we have these spin R structures and these G invariants. Um, so I'm just going to reduce the study. study. <laughs> to the spin structure case. Um, so yeah, um, an observation which was made curiously because we, we thought it was fairly, um, actually fairly obvious that it was working in both directions. But anyway, uh, in literature, only the, the, the one direction was known. So we proved in our paper that it's actually an equivalence. We proved that for a spin structure, um, on a homogeneous space, 
the spin structure is G equivariant, uh, G, G invariant. So I call it G invariant, but really it should be G equivariant, right? Just using the common name you will find in the literature, but really you should think of it as G equivariant. So that the spin structure is G invariant, if and only if the isotropy lifts um, lift to the spin group. Uh, and the idea is the following. So remember, we had this very nice representation of, um, of, of frame bundle in terms of the isotropy. And as I said before, you already can read that um, if, if we have a lift of the, of the isotropy, then this bundle here is going to be exactly um, the spin structure we want, right? And the action, uh, the following action here of, of, the, of the spin group of this bundle uh, clearly defines a gene variant uh, spin structure. So this is the idea here. So a few facts. Um, if this lift exists and H is connected, then the lift is unique. If the lift exists, um, I mean, the, the lift exists if H is simply connected. But what we found surprising, because we were expecting it to be an if and only if, um, even if H is not simply connected, then sigma can sometimes lift. And this is what happened in some of the homogeneous decomposition of the sphere. So the question is, um, when is the spin structure of a particular homogeneous space G invariant? So what is the procedure here? Um, so maybe I quite can just quickly recall the, the lifting criterion, so we, which we use, which is like really basic topology, but, uh, but I think it's really what it's based on. So, um, so when is the spin structure the G invariant. Well, we use the lifting criterion for covering maps. Well, so if we have that uh, pi is a covering map, uh, y is connected, and f is a continuous map, And we want to find out uh, when when we have a lift of this map here, right? This is our covering. When we have an F tilde. Well, the lifting criterion tells us that there exists an F tilde from Y to E, if and only if we have these at the level of the homotopy groups. So the image of the first homotopy group of Y is inside of the image um, of the covering of the first homotopy group of E, where pi E um, is equal to Fy, right? So if we take here, uh, if we look at the homogeneous space and we look at the isotropy group here, here we have, <laughs> Here we have our isotropy representation, and this is our covering by the spin group. But what we want is exactly this criteria. So we have that the lift of um, of the isotropy to the spin group exists if and only if the image of sigma at the level of homotopy group is contained in the image of um, of, of the two to one covering, right, at the level of a homotopy group, and this is trivial. So, you know, what, what do we do in order to check that a particular homogeneous space is invariant? Well, you compute the isotropy representations. This might not always be easy, <laughs> um, but in the case of spheres, we, we, we've we managed fairly well. Like, I mean, it was no problem. Um, and you look at the image of a generator and you see if, um, yeah, if it works, basically, this lifting property. So what we did in the first paper I was talking about, as I said, is that we we looked at the nine homogeneous realization of the spheres, 
um so the by i mean the action are effective here so like the, the non transitive effective group actions on spheres and those guys have been classified by montgomery and samuelson uh in the 40s and they are given so like you have like these not these uh, nine differently groups so like for these uh four groups is just the action is just the matrix multiplication right um for these it is the matrix multiplication and the diagonal action so this is a product and the diagonal action by the center uh and here as well and those are three um the three exceptional league groups and these and and here are listed the, the isotropy subgroups so i mean like um because our paper was uh um Originally, it was supposed to be a master thesis, uh, and then we found out that uh, there was like many unknown actually what we wanted to show, so we just proved it. Um, but if you're interested in in uh, at a survey uh, of computation of all the isotropy subgroup, all the group actions on the sphere, and the computation of um, of the isotropy uh, representation, well, it's all written here rather rather uh, nicely. Because uh, because it's a master thesis originally, um, and this action actually what what is what why the reason why we looked at this action is that I was interested in Riemannian holonomy, and these um these nine action coincide exactly with uh with the Berger list of Riemannian holonomy, excepted for this guy here which doesn't appear, uh, SPN uh, times U one. And for spin nine, which was originally in the list, but then it was discovered that it was a holonomic group of a symmetric space. So now um, we have this very nice criterion, which uh, which which it was also something which we, which I kind of expected to be in the literature, but we couldn't find anywhere. So um, uh, so we there is a nice link between. <coughs> The lift of the isotropy, so the fact that the spin structure on the sphere is G-invariant, and the fact that there is this lift of um, the holonomer representation with with, uh, with the group G to spin n plus one. So what we what we do is that if we have uh, an arbitrary Riemannian manifold, and we look at the holonomy group of this Riemannian manifold, which is one from the previous list, and as we know, it's also one of the group acting transitively on the sphere. So it's going to um, make a homogeneous space out of our, uh, our sphere. But then we have the results that the isotropy lift, if and only if the isotropy of the group G lifts. And um, the proof is the following. So maybe, uh, maybe I should explain it a bit better. So what's happening here is that we look at the vibration Even by the by the homogeneous space, right? S n or G mod H. Uh, and we look at the long exact sequences of homo homotopy. So what we have is uh, upstairs we look at the these representation of the spheres, right? So we have the long exact sequence of of holonomy, this is just the, inclu the inclusion. And we have also uh, the long exact sequence of homotopy for the sphere with, uh, with representation G mod H. And here uh, we have <laughs> the isotropy representation as a level of fundamental groups. And here we have the, um, the holonomy representation as a level of fundamental groups, right? And this is zero and this is zero. So this is an isomorphism, right? So basically looking back at our diagram here, this is what I mean here. Uh, we consider the commutative diagram of fundamental groups, right? With um, here, this is the isotropy representation as a level of fundamental group, and this is the um, holonomy representation as a level of fundamental group, right? This is my square here. 
And then we have that the vertical arrows are isomorphism, right? Because of the long exact sequence and because the fundamental group disappear for spheres. Um, and then we have that the top horizontal arrow is non-trivial if and only if the bottom is non-trivial. So we have our so we have our results, which which I really, really like. I mean, I think it's uh, it's something really nice somehow. Um So I mean, I, I just wanted to give you the full classification, uh, which which we've done in this paper, just to give you an idea. Um, well, I mean, all those guys are simply connected, so we know already it's invariant. We don't care. So I mean, like, what was the what was the main task is compute the isotropy representation because we couldn't really find them anywhere, so they are in there, but it's it's nothing new. Um, here, these two things are, are clearly not G invariant because, because you cannot get something non-trivial. The interesting cases where those two here, because the group is not simply connected, but, um, but nevertheless, they, they, they lift. So you find out that they lift when N is odd. And as a very simple corollary, like you can find uh, that, I mean, these are exactly this here, this one here is exactly the holonomic group of a quaternionic Keller manifold. And it's known that uh, that a node dimensional, I mean, quaternionic or dimensional Keller manifold is spin, but the proof I know of this is extremely complicated. And with this technique, we have it immediately, right? Because we know that the group of the sphere lifts to a spin structure. Well, then manifold with that holonomy must have a spin structure, which comes from the left. Um, so we, we have our results immediately. So it's, it's a really cute corollary of, uh, of our result. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. Um, I have, yeah, okay. Um, so now we've done all the work about for spin structure. Do you have any questions so far? Sorry, I was talking and talking. Okay, fine. So what about invariant spin structures now? But the good news is that everything can be generalized, almost. Um, so especially this lift of the isotropy representation. So if a homogeneous space has a G invariant spin R structure, well, then the isotropy representation lifts to the group spin R um, and conversely. So it's an if and only if. So also um, we have set if we have one direction um, of the holonomy story here, so if we have a Riemannian manifold with holonomy, uh, one of the group defining this, um, giving a homogeneous decomposition of the sphere, oops, um, then for each R, there exists a lift of the holonomy representation. Um, so if there exists a lift of the holonomy representation to spin R, then um, the sphere has a G invariant spin R structure. So the converse is really not true. So only for, for I equal ones, but there is a nice generalization, um, which, which we have found, we haven't worked too much with it, but we hope that maybe we can find some nice corollary as well um, looking at it. So the, the, the nice generalization is that there exists a left of the holonomy representation to spin R, if and only if the sphere has a G invariant spin R structure. And then we have to make some assumption uh, on the auxiliary bundle. So we topologically trivial, topologically. <laughs> trivial auxiliary bundle. So we do we do have this additional assumption on the auxiliary bundle. So the higher we get into uh into these uh these R, um well the less nice this condition is, of course, but at least we were hoping that maybe for spin C and for spin R we could find some nice um uh, geometric corollaries, we can find out of these some nice geometric um, results. But this is fairly new, as I said before, so. 
Uh, and for these as well, we give a full classification of uh, gene variant spinal structures for spheres uh, with um, well, with the gene variants. Like um, first of all, we looked at which R for which R uh, the manifold was spin R, uh, and then we look at the, at the gene variants for the spin R structures, and we get like which structures were. Um, where 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 gene g equivalent which spin our structure on there with gene variants and this is a result so of course for the simply connected we have spin so this is this is one right this is a, just a g equivalent spin structure in the case before uh, which i said was surprising was this spin for for an odd so again we get one um and here we have a spin c uh g equivalent spin structure here it's a spin h Give equivalent spin structure. So we do have some um, bit of an unexpected result here. And the corollary of these, right? So, which is here, is that the holonomy representation of an even dimensional quaternion in Keller manifold does not lift uh, to, to spin C, right? So this was something which, uh, which was new as well. So we don't have, this doesn't mean um, that we don't have a spin structure, but it means that it doesn't come. From the from the spin from a spin C structure on the sphere, from the lift of a spin C structure on the sphere, and uh, very very quickly, I can maybe give you a motivation. Well, I'm done, right? I'm over time already. No, you're not over time. We started a couple minutes late, and you've all, you've only been going for like forty seven minutes. Okay, well then then I I uh, can. <laughs> Then I can give you a very quick motivation of all of these. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, the motivation at the end of the day is to be able to cons to um, because we're talking of this representation, isotropy representation, lift of the isotropy, and um, and I mean, when we talk about representation, we we want somehow to have invariant objects, and in geometry as well, when we have a connection, we want to look at parallel objects, maybe for that particular connection, um. So in order to do that, we construct the so-called spin bundle, um, which is a vector bundle associated to the spin bundle, uh, to the spin structure via the, the spin representation, right? So we have a, we have a representation on a spin group. Sigma denotes uh, the spin module, right? Uh, and it is a spin representation. And then, I mean, as we saw before, because we have this nice construction of the frame bundle and of the lift of the spin structure, we get that the spin bundle on a, on a, on such a manifold is just given by by this nice bundle, right? The product, um, the associated bundle to the G bundle with respect to the composition of the spin representation with the isotropy, with the lift of the isotropy. And so spin also so section of this bundle can be seen as H equivariant maps uh, from G to sigma, to the, to the spin module, right? Where the group G acts with this, on spinners with this nice action, or with, a, with this nice uh, action of the spin group. So this means that, that invariant spinners fixed by this action means exactly that phi is constant. So in other words, we've reduced our problem to um, to a representation problem, right? Finding invariant spinners on homogeneous spaces um, is the same than finding sub-representation of the spinner uh, module, which are trivial for the action of uh, for the action of of sigma. Uh, or in other words, we have to find trivial sub-representation of the Lie algebra instead of G, inside of GL sigma. Um, and so we have done that for, for the case of spheres, because uh, I mean, the, the technique is fairly new. So in other words, if you're more uh, used to the, to the language of connection, um, those invariant spinners are exactly the spinners which are parallel for the canonical connection. And we have classified these invariant spinners and, uh, and looked at the geometry structures they induce on the homogeneous spheres. So we found out the dimension uh, of the space of these invariant spinners. So here, 
uh, the I mean we have seen that it doesn't lift right in the case of spin structures the spin structure um, the the isotropy representation doesn't lift so we're not going to find anything here same for these uh, same for these spaces and then this gives you the dimension of um, invariant spinners here and we can I mean we 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 computed what these spinners were so in some cases they are killing in some cases they are generalized killing. And then we computed the geometry structures they induce on the manifolds. And here it's nearly color, nearly parallel G2. So you can see really, uh, I'm not expecting you to follow that fast, but you can really see that um, with this G invariant spin structure, we're able to compute invariant objects on our manifold, which gives us nice property of the geometry uh, of the manifold. And my two PhD students, or so Jordan is finished already, um, and he's currently... Uh, well, I mean, he, he doesn't have too long to go anymore, but they're writing a paper uh, generalizing what we've done on Sphere to um to spin our homogeneous spaces. And I think I stop here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Really interesting talk. Um, are there questions? Maybe a very basic question. Um, yes. I was just wondering about the representations of these uh, spin R groups. Yes. Uh, if they are classified or if you classified them or... No, we haven't. Okay. okay. No, no. But so, in I mean... principle, it should be possible from the representations yes. of the spin groups, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, I mean, like, this is something we have we had in mind as well, but we, we haven't done it yet. I mean, like, these structures are really fairly new, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? Um, mm -hmm. Regarding those, uh, you basically take the Romanian holonomy and uh, compute or understand how the spin structure works from a Romanian holonomy. Can you say something about, um, say, the holonomy of a different connection that that also induces a spin structure? Or That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like the 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 thing is also that for uh, more general holonomies, the uh, the holonomy group are in general not classified, right? Sure. So because you don't have all these nice holonomy Riemannian holonomy tools, you have, uh, or in the case of you know Riemannian holonomy. So like what works well here is that we have the Berger classification, mm -hmm. so we can just compare um, the the transitive actions of the group on spheres and the and the holonomy groups. But in the case of uh, Connection with torsion, for example, we don't have such a um, such a nice classification. So this is a, this is an interesting question, but but I don't know if this is possible. Yeah, just because many of those geometric structures, of course, contain have canonical connect or characteristic connections and these kind of okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, like one thing we've we've thought of. I mean, because this doesn't occur um, as a holonomy group, but it's a weak holonomy group. Uh, and so this goes already in the, in the direction, right? So I mean, like we were we were looking at if maybe we could like connect these um these action with with weak holonomy results, for example. But the, so far, it hasn't worked. Okay, thanks. I have another stupid question. Uh, are you sharing the slides? Uh, I, I'm yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's a place on the web page or something. <laughs> okay okay <laughs> it's interesting okay thanks yeah. and the um, recording will also be um available um there'll be a link on the website oh yeah that's right sorry <laughs> any other questions if not thank you again thank you very much and uh, maybe if you could add me to your list i will i will join in the future i think <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. All right. Well, thank you very much again for the kind invitation. Sure. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, let me stop the um, recording. <laughs>